I think that's one of the biggest questions that pops up. When do I do what? How do I do this? Uh, and how do I approach it? Uh, how do I prep for the appointment? How do I set up my, my lead generation? How, which, you know, who do I talk to first? So the, the order of things is it's going to be one of the biggest challenges. And then every deal is different, right? Welcome to the Investor Financing Podcast, where we interview real estate investors and lenders so you can learn all the secrets to getting your projects funded and scale your portfolio. And now, your host, Bo Eckstein. Hello, everyone. This is the Investor Financing Podcast, and I'm your host, Bo Eckstein. And today, i am got the privilege of having a guest today, so you're not going to hear me talk that much, and I get to ask questions. And we're going to talk about something I'm interested in because I was never, never really in the wholesaling game and did a lot of flips, just never really built the systems around wholesaling. And, and yet I, I think that's the best business space to be in, in, in the, you know, I don't want to really manage fix and flips. I'd rather get in and get, get out and get paid quickly. It's a business where if you have the systems and the lead flow, that it can be very lucrative and, and faster money with taking less risk. So let me welcome our, our guest, Rafael Cortez, based in Phoenix, Arizona, originally from Yuma, Arizona. Has an interesting background. He was the youngest firefighter, 19 years old. That's that's crazy. Like a lot of my friends got into be, um, I grew up in California, now I'm in Las Vegas, but a lot of my friends in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, they that's what they want to do. They want to be firefighters. And I've got friends now because I'm in my 40s that are probably at 50, they'll be able to retire. It wasn't a bad career for them, but you were you were always entrepreneurial spirited. And it looks like you were you 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 had a couple like businesses growing up and and then you landed into real estate and you're also an organizational psychologist, if I'm saying that correctly. And I had to ask you before the show. So why don't why don't you kind of like in a you don't have to give us your whole story, but Give us the high level of, of like where you came from and how you got into real estate and your background of like what your business looks like today. Cool. cool. Well, first off, thank you very much for the invite. I appreciate you, uh, you having me in the show. Um, uh, so uh, very, very honored. And um, yeah, so a little bit on the on the background of things. I, I started in as a fireman and then I opened my first business when I was 21, right around 21, 22. That's when I launched it. And that was a medical transportation not emergency medical transportation business. So we did uh, ambulance, stretcher and wheelchair transport and whatnot. So I grew that into a company. In the interim, I started investing in real estate. And around 2009, uh, it's when I bought my first, uh, my first flip. And I got into it. You just said something real interesting. I mean, you, it's, uh, you know, the fact that you, you know, you flip paper as opposed to, you know, the actual properties and the, and the, um, and the management of the thing, right? Um, that was one of the things that kind of did it for me because I, I started with a couple of flips. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I didn't, I didn't leverage. I didn't do funding. I didn't do hard. I just bought the thing cash and, and my ROI on it at the end of it, because of the amount I put into it, wasn't that big. Um, and I actually just got luck, uh, lucky in the first couple of you know, flips because I didn't know what I was doing and I, I broke out even. I think I made maybe 2,500 bucks on the second one, <laughs> which I thought was a win. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's how it really, you know, kind of kind of got started um, with with flipping. Um, a couple of years after that, I, I will not not years, but I kept buying properties from from a couple a couple of people. And, and uh, I think it was around my third or fourth flip um, where I just like I'm, I'm getting emails, right? I'm seeing emails coming to my inbox with properties at discounted pricing. And it just hadn't, you know, it, the radar hadn't, you know, tagged it yet. Um, so um, I, I start, you know, really paying attention to the settlement statements and whatnot. And I start seeing assignment fees on there. Uh, you know, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars to the person who was selling me the property. But I didn't know I didn't know anything about real estate, so I didn't know what that meant. When I would look at the settlement statement, I would just look at the at the amount that I had to pay, and then break down the fees. I would just kind of fly through those. I mean, honestly, I wasn't paying attention, which which <laughs> it's a really bad thing, right? Starting off, um, but that's how I kind of you know I got exposed to it. I was paying for the properties, and and like you know what, I'd rather push paper and flip my vested interest in a property than actually come in and then do the, the swinging of the hammers. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I got, uh, you know, into real estate, uh, growing up, uh, high school and college, I worked construction. Uh, so I did, you know, framing and, and masonry and all that stuff. Right. So that's kind of what gave me the, uh, the confidence to start doing flips. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's a lot, 
a lot better just to you know negotiate a property and do you know do a systematic approach to finding deals and then moving it. It's a lot faster. It's just you know to me, it's a way better model. So. <laughs> I would agree. After looking at a lot of business models and real estate investing, yeah. um, I do think, you know, obviously you should retain some properties for tax benefits and, and right. things like that. But, but you know, to make money, uh, I think it's by far the way to go. Uh, if I would, if I could circle back and, and just go back to, to when I started, I just missed out on so many opportunities, but there'll be, there's a lot of opportunities going forward. What's your thoughts on like the market right now? I mean, we've gone through like a, a crazy market cycle. Like I would have thought it would have ended and now it just keeps going and going and going. Are you bracing for some, some, a little bit of a, a slowdown in the market at some point? How are you adjusting? And like, what's your thought process on that? The, uh, the thing that's another, and I'm, I mean, I'm going to sound completely biased on this, but it's really, it's really how I feel about it. Uh, when, when you're in the, um, I, I own a couple of, uh, at this point now, I own a couple of uh, businesses in real estate. So I have the organizational psychology practice. We do coaching and consulting. And I have the wholesale business, I have a fix and flip business, and I own a brokerage as well. Um, so we're always looking at the market activity, especially in our own backyard. And um, what, it, what it does is because we're all, always running comparables, we're looking at mortgage rates and mortgage really, I mean, dic kind of dictate what's going to happen to the residential market in you know, three, four months time. If mortgage rates get you know, too flexible or you see drastic changes over there, it's going to ripple effect into the uh, residential market, right? Uh, so we're always looking at mortgages first. It's, it's one thing that if uh, people in, or the audience is not uh, doing yet, I would highly suggest looking into it. You don't have to understand the whole thing. Just kind of understand how to recognize red flags. So if you, if you feel a red flag in mortgages, uh, pay a little bit of attention to it and then try to just kind of figure out where that goes because it's the most, uh, I've, I've found out it's the most uh, you know, tried and, and tested indicator for, for changes in our market. Now, when it comes to the, um, the, uh, the, how dynamic the market is, for la you know, just to say, you know, so I don't say crazy, uh, but it's crazy. It's nuts. It's, it's, it's insane, right? It's, um, I, the, um, I see it as an opportunity. So I stopped. Um, we'll, we'll still do flips, but we really dropped the amount of flips that we're doing um, because of supply and demand, right? So right now we're able to negotiate properties and we know that investors or flippers are paying a higher price point because the supply is low and the demand is high. It's just, you know, the market is tight, uh, especially in Maricopa County where I'm at, right? So we're seeing a, a shift in supply and demand, which started about, you know, six months ago. That's really kind of where, where it started hitting the numbers and the thresholds for offers on our side. What we did, we were able to just adjust to that and then go along with the, uh, with the, with the flow. So um, supply you know, got tighter. Sellers started asking for more money. We were able to offer more because we knew we could dispo the property for you know, that much more on the back end, right? Because supply and demand was just tight. But if you follow those cycles, if you follow and pay attention to, okay, how is you know, the basic principle of supply and, uh, supply and demand, how is it impacting my market right now? Um, and then you look at what appraisers are doing, you know, where they're capping off properties. They're doing a really good job at, about not letting uh, property values skyrocket in, in Maricopa County. So we're looking at that and we're able to kind of mitigate where the sweet spots for the offers are. So it, it's not, I mean, the supply and demand, it's kind of, you know, it's coming back. It's not really regulated yet, but we see the adjustment, right? Coming into it. Um, and that's also another reason I, that you, you brought up a good point. If you're wholesaling properties, you're not really as concerned with markets because uh, you could cancel a contract, or, and, and it's so fast that it's not going to happen overnight. And you're right. you're you usually have a buyer lined up before you even sign the contract, probably, uh, or, or kind of an indication of where that's going. So the people that would make you know possibly get hurt are the people that are doing these large renovations, speculating that the market's still going to rise. Like those those are, that's where the risk really lies in yeah um so the wholesaling business for risk is a lot less um than 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 flipping houses um yeah, and, plus, and it's faster it's a faster way to get paid and you're in like one of the most uh competitive markets like there's like a bunch of you guys out there it's like i always <laughs> say like everybody is wholesaling in arizona it's like how do you guys do it but it but just, there's that, so much business out there right and there and yeah. it just it's just harder to get deals but the more innovative you guys are for 
building the list, right? And going after these people or different lists to get these deals. Do you buy most of your, are you most of your deals um, just traditional kind of assignment deals? Are you doing any sub twos and things like that or just? Yeah. Yeah. So we, I mean, we, we have a couple of different t- uh, tools that, you know, that we implement. We'll start off with a regular wholesale offer. We have certain thresholds for that kind of stuff. Um, we have a very solid buyers list. So at this point, we're able to like, you know, figure we have a pretty good um, pulse on what our buyers are willing to do. Right. Uh, How, you know, how high we can push some properties. We segment the buyers list so we know what to you know kind of push to each one of those uh, uh, segments. So we work both ends of it. So we'll work the seller side. We'll structure a deal on the seller side and find a solution, um, create a win win and then lock the property down and then really like niche, niche it out on the back end. Um, and have a really good relationship or idea of where that property is going to go to on the dispo side. But that's, I mean, that's helped tremendously. Yeah, uh, the market is competitive, but when you have um, a uh, a good infrastructure in place, it, it's still, I mean, we keep people, some people hit zip codes. Uh, you know, I got, I'm, I'm doing a wholesaling in this zip code in this area or south of Phoenix or East Valley or West Valley. The way it works for us here, just because of the, the, the valley is, is so big and there is so much competition, we just got to hit the whole valley, right? It's, it's a matter of volume. Um, if you have a, a good system in place where your leads don't fall through the cracks and you're able to have consistent follow-ups, um, you know um, how to structure the, uh, the solutions and the win-wins and all that stuff, you're going to be doing okay because uh, the, the, um, the contact rate and the follow-ups are going to put you first of mind when it comes to sellers, right? We're just there all the time. Whenever they do uh, decide to pull the trigger, uh, we're right there. And we know what, you know, how to structure the, uh, the, the, the deal so we can make money in the front end and make money in the back end. Um, yeah, we have different ways of structuring. So as, we, as we're locking up the deals, we're figuring out um, the exit strategy as well. Is it going to be an assignment? Is it going to be a double escrow? Is it going to be a um, double, you know, double close or uh, just different things, right? But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways. And you said something really important too, like having different tools and, and in terms of creative financing and, and uh, the ability to make a deal, create a deal, and see between the gaps. Uh, one thing that happens in wholesaling, it's very, very common. Somebody will show up to a seller's house and uh, they'll give them, you know, the, the, the low ball offer. Right. And that's it. If they don't go for it, they just, you know, there's nothing to be done here. And then they walk away from that, uh, from that lead. Uh, there's multiple ways of monetizing the leads. Right. And at the end of the day, it really, it really comes down to a discovery process of what the seller is looking for. Uh, not, uh, I, I was very surprised to find out through, uh, you know, through the experience and the years and time that the, it's not always the cash. They're not concerned about the cash and the offer. Sometimes it's, I mean, you have some crazy properties out there that, you know, they're just way too damaged or the situation that they're going through uh, calls for immediate, you know, response and, and relocation, divorce, you know, probate kind of stuff. There's so many things out there that impact the, uh, the buying deci- or the selling decisions of somebody that uh, when you know how to uh, how to bring solutions to that kind of problem, that's when wholesaling works. Uh, there's a lot of attrition. A lot of people get into wholesaling. They can't get a deal within a few months because they don't know the structure or the, the flow of the process. Then the, they just move on to the next thing. They move to crypto. They move to, you know, whatever. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of competition out here in the Valley. One thing I, I think one thing that um, you said, it right, like everybody's out here in Phoenix. Uh, we have some big, big names. And, uh, and all uh, like, the funny, the, the craziest thing is that we all collaborate with each other. I was telling you, you know, earlier uh, about Brent and then, you know, Steve uh, Trang and all these guys, we're always, you know, either doing deals together or helping each other improve each other's uh, business. And I think that's what makes the competition so heavy, right? We're kind of elevating and uh, leveling up as we, you know, get better and better. And, um, and it just, you know, levels up the whole playing field. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, dynamic. Yeah. So what is your, what does your, your team look like? Do you have like two acquisition specialists and then how do you, how do you structure, how do you, how do you go from a one, one team player uh, and then grow your team? What's the progression? So um, I have, I have a breakdown. It's a six stage uh, business model, really. Um, so the, the way that it works, uh, you know, stage one, you're sourcing the leads, right? 
And it's going to be like the, the easiest way in my head to explain it. But you're sourcing the leads at a stage one, you're cold calling, you're pay-per-click, whatever it is. You're just finding people who are interested and in raising their hand. And at that level, we have cold callers in place. We have three full-time cold callers. Uh, we have PPC campaigns. We have another person who manages uh, the ads and all that stuff, right? And that's going on at the sourcing level. So somebody raises their hand, they say, okay, I want an offer. It doesn't matter if it's a million dollars for a mobile home. You know, it's just, it's just they're not pre-qualifying. They're not doing anything. It's just gauging for interest. Uh, from that point, they send it into a lead manager, which is a converting stage, stage two. And I have a lead manager that that's her primary role. Anything that's sourced goes to pre-qualification. So she pre-qualifies based on condition, motivation, timeline, and price based on the four pillars. So she'll uh, pre-qualify based on those. Um, and she's just calling and following up. Now she's working on actual leads, right? Those two us are leads. Um, if she pre-qualifies somebody three out of four, she'll send it over to acquisitions. So now that's a prospect. That's stage three acquisitions. And um, the, uh, I mean, that's where they go to town. This is, this is closers. I have three closers in house uh, acquisitions managers. And, and uh, that's like their only role is to just get a signature in the contract. So by uh, here's, here's a, the, the cool thing about that, right? Your, um, your acquisitions people are trained to close. They're trained to negotiate. You don't want to waste their talent cold calling. You don't want to waste their talent pre-qualifying, right? People are going to get burned out. If you don't have enough people to talk to uh, or prospects to talk to, at an acquisition, uh, talk to at an acquisitions level, it means that your conversion or your pre-qualification is lacking, or it means that your lead generation is lacking. You know, one of the two. So we break it down that way. And at, uh, by the time they get to acquisitions, there's something workable. There's some, they, because they've already had two conversations, one with the cold caller and then one with the lead manager. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, this is interesting because I'm, I, I have another business. I have a lending business and I have an expense reduction business and we work with business owners. So I'm taking notes here because yeah. uh, I just hired my first telemarketer. And I, I, um, I have three virtual assistants in the Philippines, not for calling, but they do kind of video editing and things. So mm -hmm. I actually went to Mexico and got a telemarketer in Mexico. Um, and, and so I'm like kind of taking the notes right now, just like on how do the, how these systems work. And I could see like, okay, there, there, you have it broken down. I, I need to, do you have like a little mind map of this? Cause I want brother, to copy. <laughs> brother, I'll send it to you. Oh yeah. Uh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's actually, well, I have, I mean, it, the easiest way to kind of picture it, and this is what I give my students, it's a, it's a wheel, right. Of the six steps going into it. And then, uh, just breakdowns of what each one of those is. So the third one is acquisitions. They go through this negotiation discovery. They know how to structure the offers and whatever they, they have this whole thing in place. Um, and then from that point, they get the contract signed and it goes to dispo. So now my, my director of operations, uh, starts, you know, getting in there. He's also the uh, dispositions manager. Uh, so we do transaction coordination and everything that happens on that dispo stage uh, is, is, you know, is handled during that, you know, fourth stage, which is dispo. <laughs> I said that twice in the same sentence. Uh, so um, that's where, like, uh, here's the thing, uh, but like, that's where most of the companies kind of stop their, their, their business model, right? We got, we dispo the property, we got paid, we are good. And then they move on to the next deal. Uh, I think it's a big mistake because you don't know what's working. If you don't have the awareness or the conscious, uh, you know, uh, pay close attention to what's really working in terms of uh, what's being effective within your business, uh, you can't, it's not repeatable, right? So you have to measure, which is step five. We measure, we track KPIs, we track the campaigns, we see what the conversion rate was, uh, what in lead or what, uh, um, I'm sorry, what campaign uh, gave us this particular lead? How could we have, you know, done better in the deal and whatnot. So that's, that's what happens at the measuring stage. We have certain KPIs that we track and every deal, believe it or not, every deal that we close, we'll do a, a we'll measure it. Um, and then we have a stage six, which is the improvement. Like we break it down and that's where we have consistent uh, weekly meetings. Every, you know, we'll talk about the closings that happened last time. And this is where a lot of the uh, SOPs and protocols Mm -hmm. uh, start popping up like, oh, you, crap. You know what? We had this thing with a post possession. Well, next time that happens, we're going to turn it into a, just a protocol. And it's, you know, it's in the book, it's in the manual of operations now. And now we have something, right? So we start putting together this business based on, on experiential stuff, not just theoretical stuff. Um, and it's, those are the six steps, like the six steps that build the, uh, the structure of the model. Um, the, the interesting part is that 
if you break down those six, th those same six steps, same stuff that I use in my brokerage, uh, my real estate agents. I mean, of course, there's pivots, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Inside the actual details of the, the how to's, uh, but the, the, we still have six stages to my brokerage. And it's the same thing. We source, uh, we convert, we acquire, we dispo, we measure, and then we improve. That's, that's a flow. And, and I want to kind of unpack something. This is like important. I always thought this because I have, I was selling a lot of houses as a broker as well back in the day. And um, I mean, it seems to be, if you have a wholesaling business, you should be vertically integrated with the brokerage because yep. when you're doing your discovery, like you talked about earlier, maybe the discovery is, Hey, the best thing is for you to sell the property. And, and you just spent $800 generating that lead or whatever it was, right. why not convert it into a 3% commission? Yeah. Uh, so that's probably when phase two came to be for you and the brokerage. Yep. Okay. Yeah, then absolutely. So we will market for, for distressed uh, properties, right? Uh, once we have, once we're engaged in that conversation, we never lead. We always disclose that we're real estate professionals. I mean, disclosure is the name of the game. Uh, we have radical transparency with everybody that we approach and, and you know, we tell them this is what we're looking at doing. We take down a lot of properties. So it's, it's not like um, we will we'll never go to a seller and tell them, listen, we want to buy your property if our intention is not that. Um, so we, we do tell them like what we do, right. When we're working from the pulse capital side of things, um, that's the, the wholesaling business. So we'll tell them, listen, there's, you know, after we're going through the, uh, through, after we kind of level out our numbers and we figure out if this is going to work and we get a contract signed, we'll tell them how we're going to dispo the property. So we disclose it right there. And we tell them, listen, uh, sometimes we take down the properties. Sometimes we assign the properties. We have people who come in and then they just, they buy it. So we'll, you know, they'll take over. You still get the same deal on your side, uh, but there's different ways of dispositioning. A lot of times we will keep the property and then just keep it as a rental. So just need you to know that, right? Um, when you disclose it like that and you, you open up the, uh, you know, the, what you're going to do with the property, people, uh, the people are, are a lot more open, right? And um, on that same token, if nothing works from the wholesale side, uh, we tell them, listen, we're also brokers. I mean, obviously you want to sell, which is not a match for it. If you want to do, you know, work with us, uh, now we can, you know, do something else on the traditional side of things and then push it over to the brokerage. So we're monetizing on the leads as we're coming into it. Yeah. And in theory, you're probably, your brokerage side from these leads probably pays for everything. I mean, everything else yeah. is gravy on top of that. It, um, yeah. it, and then obviously there's, new agents that are selling and just the broker business is going to be profitable on the other, you know, just the traditional business. Yeah. But that's like a really good, what other, um, are those your kind of two core businesses right now? Well, and the coach, you have a coaching business. Is that kind of right. your focus? Do you have any other kind so, of things you so integrate in? It, it's interesting, but everything overlaps. I have, um, so I started a uh, CEO Pulse. It's my organizational psychology uh, business. That's, that's that brand. Um, but everything overlaps, right? So I do a lot of consulting in businesses in general through my organizational psychology practice. I've done gyms, restaurants, and whatnot. And we, you know, we break down systems. Uh, I have a, um, a framework. I call it the less business, more profits framework. Less as in lean, effective, strategic, and simple. Uh, if I can't make a business, if I can tr uh, turn it into a, a business that's lean, that's effective, that's strategic, and that's simple to implement and accountability, like it's going to work. Right. So I look for a certain set of um, uh, things when I'm putting something together. But I have that through CEO polls. Now, the cool thing is that they all talk to each other now. Um, the uh, CEO polls, I mean, really pushes the, the coaching side. That's how I build the business. And then I fine tune the wholesaling operation, which uh, feeds my fix and flip business, uh, which feeds my real estate brokerage. I mean, my agents end up listing my properties that I you know, come in and fix and flip. So it's all talking to each other, creating this this uh, like little ecosystem under the uh, the umbrella of the Pulse Group. So is is organizational psycho psychologist is that like something you coined or is that actually a really <laughs> no you know what I've gotten that question so many times it's actually a real thing it's a real yeah. thing so you have to uh, you have to go through general psychology first. Um, and then you specialize in something. I chose to specialize in business. My, my bachelor's was in business management, um, servant leadership and applied management. And uh, I got my uh, a master's. My first master's was in general psychology. Um, and then I could have gone clinical uh, or business. So I chose business. And uh, that's that's all that. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Because it's when I look at all the successful people I know, um, they've, they've gotten good you know, 
they they get it they get something whatever they're selling or their service is and they just build a great mousetrap essentially right like and it's <laughs> all systematized that's what i was yeah. missing if i could go back in my early 20s that's what i that's what i really was missing is is like you have to get like a uh somebody that wants to sell their house isn't going to just fall on your lap unless it's just dumb yeah. block right like yeah you yeah. might have a couple realtors that send you some off-market deals once in a while and you get lucky and you know, in California, you can get a, you know, a six figure spread sometimes. And, yeah. But but that's not like really a sustainable business model. It's more like uh, just kind of luck and the market's appreciating and you just, you know, found a. But what you do is really create systems that actually that actually squeeze the juice. Absolutely. hundred percent. And that's, that's where the whole, like the, those last two sections of that uh, framework, uh, you know, come in, right. That's the, uh, the measuring and the, the improvement. Um, there's no way to figure that out. There's no way to create sustainability. If you're not paying attention to what's happening, the numbers are important. Um, I have this, this uh, fight against uh, the, the hustle mentality. And, and I always, like, I always, talk about that but it's it's um i think hustle is a season not a business strategy right we all need the hustle to get off the ground and then put the elbow you know grease in especially if you're bootstrapping a business uh, that's how you're going to get results you get committed to it and then you just you know go to town on that uh on you know that product whatever it is that you're working on you go to town on it and that hustle mentality but it, it's it's going to get you to to the first set of results um but it's not sustainable like you can't hustle your way to sustainability, to uh, to uh, consistency in a business, it's not if if you're always trying to figure things out. Uh, I one uh, one time somebody told me you know, hustle is is connected to uh, to figuring things out, right? A a um, in an entrepreneur mindset or a business mindset, it's connected to um, organizational you know type of stuff and 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 processes and systems. So that's making that shift. I think it's important, right? From that hustle mentality to that business owner mentality, uh, where you start to implement systems, plug people into you know the spots where you need to plug them into. Think who, not how. Who's better at this than I am? I just uh, read that book, by the way. Oh, dude, it's fantabulous. Are you talking with the new one that was just released? Um, with um, what's his name? I, I just have it on Audible. I can't think of it. He's strategic coach guy. Um. Uh, um I can't. Uh, we'll we'll figure that out. <laughs> we'll circle that. I'll put it in the show notes. But anyways, I just listened to Who Not How. Yeah. And it's so true because I'm an idea guy. Yeah. And like I get like the framework of everything, but I'm not an integrator by any means. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that's my uh, that's my how this person. And, and so now, but like, okay, let's rewind it. So what what's your so you bring on? Let's just use me as an example. I'm bringing on my first. Uh, appointment setter slash telemarketer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I decided to go out of the country just because the, you know, I could, the cost and they're probably better or just as good uh, yeah. than I'd find probably better because they're more, you know, they're more hungry I, to make money. I, um, <laughs> so, you know, I created an SOP. I, I have a script. I have a friend. I'm not using like auto dialer at this point. Cause we're just, that's the next step, right? Like mm -hmm. I have a, CRM call system. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still in that learning curve where I got to like figure out, Hey, the script I'm giving this lady to make phone calls, is that really the best script? Is that the best, are we approaching the best person in the business that, you know, in the, in the work, like, cause we're calling business owners. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, but I know if I can create the systems around it, I could just like, I have my manual now, my SOP and I could just, replicate this over and over again for lead generation. Cause I'm guessing in your wholesaling business that probably 50% or so of your business comes from cold calling from wrong or right. Right. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's actually the backbone. The reason we like cold calling, or I, I specifically like uh, pushing cold calling as a lead um, generating uh, strategy at the beginning, it's because it generates leads, but it also, um, you got to have a thick skin, man. If you're going to jump into real estate, this thing is not, I mean, it's simple, but it's not easy. There's a lot of rejection. You're going to get a, you know, a lot of no's. 97% of the people you're going to call, uh, they're going to say no. And they're, you know, and, and about 96% of those are going to say it in a very ugly way. Uh, so you just got to have a thick skin, right? We're, we're looking for a very small portion of the, uh, of the population that, that's looking to sell. So cold calling puts you in that space, puts you, I mean, it just gets you in the, in the, 
in the vibe or in the flow of repetition. And then you start getting numb, right? To the rejection. You start increasing your skills because you have a lot of conversations. So I love the way that works as you're starting up a business and repetition is a key. I mean, it's like nothing is going to increase your, your, your skill set like repetition is. So we have, we have that. It works. Um, it's still not one of those things that's highly, highly regulated. For example, um, uh, ringless voicemails. I mean, those things got red flagged within a matter of eight months. SMS is getting there, right? Text messaging is getting to a point where it's very red flag. You have to watch out. There's a lot of um, safeguards that you have to consider if you're doing SMS texting just to stay compliant. PPC is getting more expensive. So different ways of marketing work in different ways. The one thing that's always been evergreen is cold calling. Like if you want to start generating leads, I mean, we, we definitely, we get most of our leads through, through cold calling. Then we uh, supplement through SMS and, and PPC, pay-per-click. Yeah. And so that at the end of the day, there's no magic. Ready to dump your W-2 job or start a second career? Interested in owning your own business? Have you thought about owning a franchise? Introducing Emerge Franchise Group. We have systematized a simple process to get you on your way to owning your own franchise. It's a simple five-step system to quickly identify the best franchise concepts that would work for you and your lifestyle. Book a call today by visiting EmergeFran.com or call 925-852-8261. What are your like KPIs behind knowing if your appointment setter telemarketer is is kind of like what are your expectations in a day? So if you're if you're hiring out and you're taking you know one of the companies out there, uh, two to three leads a day, um, it's not you know it's not uncommon, all right? It's not necessarily a bad number just because of the uh, the the volume that they're, you know, they're putting out there. So two, two to the leads a day, a day, it's a good healthy number per caller, right? So if you have a couple of callers in house, or I'm sorry, in, you know, hired out, you should be getting a good healthy amount of leads. All these leads still in my company, they still go through my lead manager because I want them pre-qualified. They're not, they're not being pre-qualified I and mean, they have their own scripts. If you hired it out to another company, they'll have a script. Um, and they'll go through that, but I, I don't know. It's, I still want to have our own conversation with them. The um, we do hire out for cold callers. I used to have in-house cold callers and we used to train them and then take them through the whole process. And we have a specific script that we give them and breaking it all down. But the turnover rate for cold callers is very high. So you are training people every two months, you know, uh, just because they come and then they go, they come and then they go. And then all you find yourself doing is, uh, you know, it's fine tuning that one role. And there's a lot of turnover, but if we hired it, I mean, that's why we have such a, you know, if you're hiring out telemarketing, um, you know, we're, I know we're always calling like the, uh, the client success manager of that company, right? Like what's happening? What, you know, how come we got a, a drop in, in leads? It's because the turnover rate is, is high. I mean, so they have a challenge hiring and replacing. So we hire out that, that, um, that position just because of, the um the mental energy or the the yeah the mental energy that it takes to keep training people over and over again and the consistency. Where are their callers from? Are they in the states? Or are they uh, out of the country? Right now, I use out of the country. So they have um they have Egypt and then Philippines. My lead manager, she's an in house. She's part of my, uh, the in house uh, company. She's the lead manager. So she's the first point of contact inside the, the company. Mm -hmm. So she'll come to my uh, weekly, uh, weekly meetings and we break down KPIs and whatnot. So she used to be a cold caller, but she, I mean, she, she was just killing it. She was killing it and she was generating so many leads and she was always there. So I promoted her to lead manager. Now she's the lead manager. She handles the cold callers. I don't have to deal with the cold callers. That's her role, right? It's part of the, the, that's, you know, second stage in that lead manager position. So they report to her and she'll report the KPIs to my director of operations. Um, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, like I'm running the business, literally, this is, this is what's, what's, I feel so blessed is because I'm running the business on 90 minute meetings um, a week. So we, we do uh, every Tuesday, we get together at 1030 AM and then cut it off at noon. Uh, but we go through KPIs, we go through um, deals that we're working on. And then we go through any, we have a, a, a we dedicate about a third of the meeting to just personal um, aspirations. So personal goals, I call them the top threes. 
But each person inside the team, lead manager, director of operations, dispo, acquisitions guys, we all talk about like a, a couple of the personal priorities that we have and, and how we're doing in those. It's just an extra thing that we do uh, as a company. But that's, that's the, um, like the content of, of the meeting. And um, I come into those meetings uh, from, from a consultant um, perspective because they're running it. So I, I, I mean, I, I get to have, you know, that 50,000 foot view of what's happening, come in and then fine tune, we move processes, systems in place, and then step away. And then they still do their thing. You know what, that's, that's, that's the thing. But she was hired, uh, going back to lead manager, she was hired as a cold caller, and she just got promoted. Um, so the I've heard it a 1000 times to you like, no, no, people overseas are not, you know, it's not it's bad quality. Yeah, you may have to go through a couple of them. But it, it really comes down to the type of leadership, man. I mean, they, they want to belong as well, just like we do. They're not laptops. You know, VAs, yeah. are, not, VAs are not laptops. <laughs> yeah, I, I always tell people that. I go, listen, I've, I've worked with VAs for years. And, yeah. um, you know, sometimes you forget they're people, right? Like, hey, they're just people in another country. And we forget that. And I'm like, listen, Bro. stop yeah. and ask them how their day's going. Get on Zoom yeah. with them, even though they're in the Philippines or whatever, right? And like, be good to your people. And they're, yeah. they're good to you. I I don't micromanage my uh, assist, uh, my virtual assistants. They they're good at what they do. Yeah. And I'm like, this is perfect for me because I don't want to have a lot of employees. I like to rather have independent contractors and right. You know, I just want to have that. I, I don't want a huge organization. So it's like the outsourcing is like amazing. So it's it's yeah. we have so much technology at our at our fingerprints. So when you're when you're um, so if you could just give a little bit of wisdom to somebody that might be listening to this and saying, you know, because we get, I get calls all the time. People are calling for loans. Like, oh, can you do this loan, this loan, this yeah. loan? I'm like, have you ever done a deal? No. Okay. Well, call me when you have something you're looking at, at least. A little and, track record. Yeah. Yeah. And not, and, and so it's the same thing in wholesaling, right? Everybody sees these people on, you know, Instagram and YouTube and they're making money and they have nice cars and um they want they want to get into real estate and 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 wholesaling's probably the best place to start because you don't need money or credit you just need drive and uh, a brain to like learn the basics yeah so if you were to go back and tell yourself you know prior to you with any real estate experience like you know i guess it's it's what what advice would you have to like you know let's just say they don't they don't have a lot of i mean obviously once they get a little bit of money they should reinvest and get coached like by the best of the best, right? If you're going to like get all the really smart people I know have coaches, right? Like, because they're like, I'm going to pay somebody for their coaches. brain. Coaches right? have coaches. And then yeah. after you're yeah. done with coaches, you still join mastermind, which yeah. masterminds, which is just another form of coaches. Um, but they're, you know, cutting the learning curve is always the, uh, like, honestly, I would not want to go back and then re like figure this whole thing out again. Um, I'm going to be biased when it comes to that, right? It's what I do. I coach. But it's very important if you can't, if you can't, you know, jump into a program, you can't pay like all the information is out there. You know, YouTube University is out there. You can you start just, you know, wholesale, look up a wholesale. Um, the information on how to read a contract is out there. There's going to be a thousand million, you know, whatever um, strategies on how to close and negotiate. You're going to see videos. You're going to see live. Everything's out there. It's just out in the web. The problem is the order of things. I think that's one of the biggest questions that pops up. When do I do what? How do I do this? Uh, and how do I approach it? Uh, how do I prep for the appointment? How do I set up my, my lead generation? How, which, you know, who do I talk to first? So the, the order of things is it's going to be one of the biggest challenges. And then every deal is different, right? So as you get more and more experience, you start to understand. I mean, it's the same thing that we do and every time we improve, you know, from a we start to create new SOPs and whatnot, but you don't have that stuff going on like at the beginning. Um, you just don't have, you know, that that uh, that extensiveness in the industry yet. It's just something that comes through time, right? So somebody's jumping in, I would highly recommend, um, I mean, cut the learning curve one way or the other. Go work for somebody. I mean, volunteer. If they're not giving you, you know, 10% of the commission, that's fine. Uh, if you feel like they're a good company to work for or a good person to do acquisitions for or dispositions, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to you know, get better at, um, look at it almost as a uh, internship, a paid internship. Uh, but tap into that kind of stuff. There's people out there who are willing to, to, uh, to create a win-win, right? I've done that with people who come and work in my company. They, you know, they end up doing really good. And then you know, I help them out you know, after they leave, which is fine. Um, 
but cut the learning curve one way or the other. Uh, there's, there's, um, uh, there's, it's, there's so much technology out there, information, and in, in, in at this point, put people willing to to help people out in JV and partner up, uh, or coach or teach and and walk others through the process. That it's just insane to sit there and try to figure it out just because of a uh, like an eagle ride. It's usually how, you know why that happens. Uh, oh, I got this. I can figure it out. I mean, you can, but it's gonna take ten years as opposed to you know three months. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I always. I already know uh, because when I want to learn something, I'll spend a couple grand to learn it. Right. And yeah. because it's like, I could get like go the hard route or go the easy route. And, you know, this is a business where you could get started literally to today. You could start right. picking up the phone and, and potentially you could have your first deal in the next two weeks and make 10, 20, 30, 40 grand. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's out there. Let, let me um, on, on that note. Um, if uh, if I have a couple of minutes, I I, I can sure. just kind of give you the first few steps that somebody can do to start with no money, uh, and just you know find finding free lists and and how to uh, how to do it. So let me see if I can do just to put together something here. Um, step one, it's gonna be getting a list, right? Uh, start with your power team, um, and I suggest taking notes on this. Uh, start with your power team. So talk to a title company or closing company um, in your state. It just varies depending on the state. But uh, go to that title company or that escrow officer or the closing agent and then tell them, listen, I'm, I'm about to drop a marketing campaign here uh, in the area and I want to bring the deals over. Um, I need data. They will give you data lists. They will give you absentee owner lists. Um, so ask for the absentee owner list. Ask for a 60-day late list. Um, you can go to the city too and then uh, find out if they have code violation lists. And you can skip trace, all right. So you have you're gonna pull those lists. You're gonna have you're gonna have to spend a little bit of money somehow, some some way. You might as well be skip tracing in, in your own data, right? So skip trace that. I use batch leads for skip tracing, or I'm sorry, batch skip tracing. Um, and then after you after you're doing that, you can I highly suggest you know somebody jumping into a power dialer. It's like the the fastest use of of time, the most effective use of time, really. Uh, but if you don't, you can start dialing that out. You know, just people on those lists, and um, look for when you're looking for the list too. You can look for um, absentee owner. That's one. Uh, you can look for high equity lists. These are high volume lists. They're not necessarily the, the, the most, you know, well-kept secrets or anything like that. It's nothing like that. It's just high volume lists, um, that you're going to start getting exposed to those. Uh, those are ways to hit the phones right now. If you want to create your own list, drive for dollars, it still works. I mean, it works wonderfully. Actually, we're, we're, we have a drive for uh, dollars operation in Yuma, uh, drive around, Take a note of the uh, of the address. If you're outside the property, drop a post it and say, "I'm buying houses." Okay, uh, please give me a call back and then put your phone number on it. You can do that, and then you can follow up with a skip trace and a phone call, and then just stay up, uh, stay on top of that list. Um, those those are like the fastest ways to get to uh, to sellers. But uh, title companies are willing to work with you in that sense because they want your business, so they spend a lot of money. Uh, buying into these data companies uh, to pull right title records and and property info and all that stuff. We can we can pick it back off of that if you just have a conversation with them. And, and if you have like if you were willing to spend like a hundred bucks a month, you can get like something like PropStream or one of those. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, PropStream is is a very good uh, piece of software. It's got a, all kinds of data in it. You can pull I think ten thousand records a month off of that. Batch Leads is also another one that has really good data. Um, and, and there, so, so, so right there, there are a hundred bucks or so for those services right. a month. So you could really just start there for a hundred bucks a month yeah. and get probably a little bit better data and more data at your fingertips. Um, and then, uh, bat skip trace, you can, if you can't find their contact information, now you're just calling them, you yeah. come up with your script. Hi, this is Bo, and I, you know, I, I see that you don't live at this property. I was just wondering. I'm looking for a property in the area. Will you be willing to right. sell it? Yeah. Or you gotta, you gotta fine tune your script and see what works, doesn't work based on the, you know, high and, equity versus. And and uh, Bo, if you go, I mean, if you go, just Google, you know, seller script, wholesale seller script, and just go there and then look up, do a search. I mean, you're gonna have, I guarantee you're gonna have, you know, dozens of scripts just pop up, right? It's gonna give you a good idea. 
uh, again, the information is out there. It's just about the the order of things and then fine tuning as each individual situation kind of comes up. I mean, that's where coaching really comes invaluable. Um, I mean, you're going to learn the infrastructure of it, but it's fine tuning, you know, the, the steps along the process that, that really make it worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's, that's pretty, it's, doesn't seem like rocket science. I guess the real key on, on, um, it's the kind of whole 80, 20 rule. Like yeah. there, there's going to be, you know, uh, out of 10 people listening to this, there's going to be eight people that say, Oh man, I want to be a wholesaler. Yeah. But they never, they never pick up the phone. They never order, uh, you know, a lead provider and they never start making calls. Um, and, uh, then there's the, the two out of 10 that actually start making calls today. And, you know, maybe, you know, the reality of it is it probably takes two or 300 dials to get one lead. I don't know what the numbers are. We, you have your KPIs, but the reality is it's something like a lot of calls to get one lead, right? Yeah. Is that like oh, a two two hundred calls to yeah, three hundred calls? It's um, well the uh, the cold callers are on average hitting about three hundred and fifty, <clears throat> yeah, about a three hundred and fifty records a day. That's a reach, and then we have I have the KPIs listed. Uh, I can't remember what this week's were, but but usually we get on average about two. I mean, average it out to two leads a day, but they're calling three hundred and fifty. Uh, to 400 numbers, each one of them. And then we get about two leads on average uh, from from those uh, from those calls, like that you got pushed into it. They actually had a conversation that we're looking to sell. And these are, I mean, it depends on the list that you're hitting too, right? So some lists are going to be a lot more receptive and 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 open than others. Absentee owner is just a big list. Everybody and their mom is hitting the absentee owner list. Um, if you do, for example, a driving for dollars and 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 you start hitting individual properties, that's going to be a list that only you have, right? Um, one one easy way to go about driving for dollars list is to look up those 60 day lates, uh, look up pre foreclosure lists, uh, have title companies give you the addresses of those or just pull the list from uh, PropStream or, or batch leads. And um and map it out, map out 25 properties that you're going to be able to go uh, drive by uh, on Sunday, right? Create a route of those 25 properties and actually go hit them, go door knock them. If you don't want to door knock and have a conversation, which I think is the best way, um, you can always leave like a postcard or a post-it note on the door, but make some type of contact with those properties that are niched out. And you're going to, I mean, those are going to be responses. The, the response rate is a lot higher on that than, um, than it is on absentee owner stuff. So absentee owner, we hit him. Uh, I mean, we I, pretty much what I did was buy the well, I bought the whole county and we're consistently hitting the county. Like it's just we're going through the records, 1.2 million records in 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 the database um, of just property owners. And um, but going through that takes a while, right? But it's it's uh, you're looking at 350 to 400 to get a couple of leads, um, and then you need multiple leads to close a deal. So it's really like that's really where the power dialer comes in very very handy. And is that like a Mojo dialer or something like that? Maybe yeah, we use we use uh, we use a batch dialer. Um, batch we actually we use batch dialer and we have Zen call. Uh, we just kind of uh, jump between the two of them. So batch actually has a dialer too. Yeah. They have, so they they have like a fully integrated software system. Software. They we I mean I keep bringing the name up because we use them. We use them for yeah, for yeah. to run comps. We pull the data. We have the batch leads which uh, stacks the data. Uh, multiple list you, you can stack your own data in the same place so it's that's pretty it's pretty handy because you're you're pulling out of your own data at one point um and then the dialer it just connects every time we upload something for sms blast we blast out of there too um it'll connect and then you have you can call the same list without having to do any additional uploads or stuff like that so it's i mean it's pretty neat the way they they have it all wired intertwined you got you guys don't really do emailing do you i mean no no. no, we're not. We're not doing. We're not doing a lot of email because it's hard to get it, property owners' emails. I suppose like business owners. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty amazing. And how old are you now? I'm 38. 38. Yeah. Okay, so you've been doing this a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I launched my first business. I launched it when I was 21. Yeah. And, and I I jumped into real estate in 2009. Um, and you know it's been going on since. I sold the other business, and I mean, I just you know real estate. Uh, the the thug life i didn't choose the thug life the thug life chose me yeah you got in at a good time too like you got in like right after the <laughs> the shit hit yeah. the fan oh and yeah so, so you've seen houses you that were you you were uh 
selling for 50 grand are now worth 400,000. Well, yeah, you're talking, you know, $20,000 in, in West Phoenix. Uh, and now they're, you know, $300,000, 350. It's crazy. Is, is, it, what's Yuma like? I, I've, I've never been, but um, is, is that kind of close, border town? It's close to the border? It, it's about 25 miles from the border, 27. Um, so I, I grew up in the border town, which is 27 miles south of Yuma. But anytime I say San Luis, which is my hometown, like nobody knows, knows where that, where that's at. Is uh, that, can I, is that the way I go to like Puerto Penesca, Penesca, uh, Rocky point? Yes, like Rocky in- point? No, that's, that's actually, no, not if you're going through Phoenix. Oh yeah. So it, uh, it's kind of like the parting road to that. It's like halfway between Phoenix and, and Yuma. Uh, which is Hillaban, but nah, no. So Yuma, I mean, it's a very slow market. It's just one of those places where the cost of living, um, the quality of living also does not make sense with the amount they pay. It's just, I mean, there's, there's some offset there. Um, yeah, I was, I, I mean, I, I grew up there and, and I was a fireman there for, for a long time and, and eventually I moved to Phoenix, but yeah, so we still do deals. Actually, one of my, uh, my top acquisition guy, he's, he's in the, uh, he's in Yuma. He lives in Yuma. He used to be one of my fire department buddies uh, back in the day. So you yeah, can imagine, you can imagine the type of conversations that happen. <laughs> my buddy uh, bought a, he bought a, a Phoenix and Scottsdale uh, Airbnb properties. He's crushing it on those properties. Oh, those are hot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he, he's doing really well on those. So what do you do? Um, you know, when you're not working, what are you doing? I, I have a feeling you do a lot of personal development stuff. I'm just curious on what, what that looks like, what kind of books you read. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm an avid reader, man. I, every, it's, a, it's a morning uh, uh, thing. You know, the, the, the whole Miracle Morning kind of got it started, but I do a lot of meditation. Um, I have my mornings are for me usually up until like 10 a.m. Um, I, I wake up, I meditate. I have a, a, I dedicate a moment of the morning just for creativeness. Uh, any ideas that are fresh in my mind, I put them to paper and, and that's, that's when that happens. So in terms of personal growth, um, I'm always looking for, when it comes to reading, I, I like to read opposites. So for example, I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, getting things done, right. It's one book that's very, uh, you know, systematic on filing and, and, you know, you do this file for this, for this, for this. And then I like to, I like to read something that's completely opposite right after that, like uh, essentialism. Uh, that's another book that I mean, talks about one thing that matters and, and, and it's the very opposites on the same topic, but what it, what it does is like, it really stimulates my, my original thinking, like, because I'll agree from, you know, with some ideas from here and then some ideas from here. And then I have, you know, I synthesize my own thoughts out of that. But uh, reading, that's that's what I like to do in books. Um, I'm not too big on on fiction. I like personal growth. I like uh, uh, business books. Um, however, one of my best, uh, most favorite reads is, uh, of all time has been uh, The Alchemist, uh, Paulo Coelho. I mean, that's that's one of the top books that I've loved. <laughs> yeah, I I, I I don't I like to listen. I listen usually when I'm doing like very low impact yeah. working out, like walking on a treadmill. But I always, that's like my time in the morning. I get up really early. I'm a big Miracle Morning fan. I, I think everybody coins it Miracle Morning because of how I'll rush now. But, it's, just, uh, it's just how we know. I mean, I, yeah. I guarantee you that what you do is not necessarily what's in there, right? Right. But, but it's, it's still, you know, it puts it into context. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm up about 4 a.m., sometimes 3.30. I get up extremely early. Savage. I, I let my dog outside make coffee, go to the gym. Usually I'm at the gym by 4.40 to 5 o'clock workout. Then I come home. Um, but I, I need to schedule more time to think in the morning. I think that's like when I'm the most creative, the most like, you know, I'm so I sometimes rush in to work and then like, yeah. why, why am I looking, going through emails? Like, what's the importance of this? There's not. Yeah. A, and so I think doing that systems is, is, is really cool. Well, uh, well, we've gone the distance here. Uh, we could talk for hours and keep on picking your brain, but we'll wait. We'll 100%. save that for <laughs> save that for another episode. Uh, but really appreciate this. And I'm, I'm I love interviewing people because it's like I always like I'm always I'm <laughs> I might be selfish because I'm always asking questions for myself. But I do the same thing on my podcast, man. Yeah. I learn so much from people in the podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's great. Well, I'm gonna uh, put your links below in the so everybody can you know if they want to find out more about you if they don't know you already and if they were interested in probably getting coached by you I would probably say that's probably a pretty good investment 
<laughs> for anybody who's listening, I'm sure you'll agree. I, I leave it all out there, man. I don't hold anything back. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, the right thing to do. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, cool. I'm going to end this here. And thanks, everyone, for watching.